All right, welcome back. It's time to start the third and last part of the course. We're going to be talking about institutions. So in the past, we have taken institutional arrangements as given, and we have thought about how firms or other economic agents behave in different, uh, given different institutions. Now we're going to look into the problem of actually designing the institutions that induce the kind of behavior that we want. The part of economics that deals with this problem is called mechanism design. And in this video, we will have a quick overview at the main question that mechanism design tries to address. In order to do so, we will have to revisit some of the tools that we have learned earlier throughout the course. All right, let's get started. Remember the first part of the course when we studied social welfare. In, in that part, we thought of a situation where we had a number of people, say N people, each of which had some individual preferences about social, over social alternatives. And we wanted to ask the question of how to aggregate those preferences to form a social criterion to decide uh, which, which alternatives are better and which alternatives are worse from a social perspective. In order to form this social criterion, we use what we call social welfare functions, uh, such as the Pareto criterion or the utilitarian social welfare function. And uh, for example, it might be the case that given the preferences that people have, the social welfare function would tell us that alternative A is preferred to alternative B, and therefore that is the outcome that we would like to see. Of course, knowing what we want to achieve is not enough uh, to guarantee that we're going to achieve it, and let's look at an example. The person that designed these barricades was probably annoyed of cyclists riding really fast through here and, and thought and that they should dismount and walk their bicycle to go through. Uh, so by building these barricades, he thought he would force cyclists to do that. What ends up happening, as you can see, is that cyclists would just ride around it, uh, which means that you know this barricade was a complete waste of money, and the only effect of this barricade was to end up creating this this weird path on the grass and to forcing pedestrians to you know uh, avoid some obstacles while they're walking through. So this is what we call bad mechanism design, and we would like to avoid. So if you guys are only going to remember one slide out of the entire course, I want it to be this one, because this really tells us why what we're doing is important. Uh, in order to design social policies, it's not just important to decide what we want to accomplish as a society, it's important to understand how people are going to behave given different policies, how people are going to react or change their behavior depending on the policies that we try to implement. And that is where game theory is going to come in handy for us. The specific institutional arrangements of the different mechanisms that we are considering can be captured by the rules of a game. Then we can use game theory to think about how to map um, how, how the, the utilities or the preferences of the individuals are going to be combined with these institutional arrangements to, to determine what is the actual behavior that we, were, we would observe if we were to implement this mechanism. In order to do so, we will be using the assumptions that we have talked about, such as the expected utility hypothesis or common knowledge of rationality. And one thing that may happen is that once we combine a specific game with the preference of the players and with these assumptions, we end up with, with, with an outcome that is not the outcome that, that we wanted to achieve given our social welfare function. So the behavior of individuals, even if it's optimal from an individual perspective, it's not always going to be optimal from a social perspective. Situations where this happens are called social dilemmas. And perhaps the most famous social dilemma is the so-called prisoner's dilemma, which by the way, you can read about it on Wikipedia or just Google it, there's tons of information. The story here is that two suspects of a crime are arrested and the DA, the district attorney, has enough information to convict them from a misdemeanor that would send them for one year to prison. The DA would like to sentence them to, to send them to prison for longer, but in order to do that, he would need a confession. So he offers each of the prisoners the following deal. If you confess, you will get a one year reduction in your sentence, but I will use your confession in order to, to increase your accomplice's sentence by five years. So the game that I end up playing is, is like the one that you can see in the table, where if they both cooperate with each other by remaining silent, they would only go to prison for one year and they'll forget a payoff of minus one. 
In contrast, if they both defect, then uh, by by signing the confession, then each of them would get one year sentence reduction, but a five year sentence increase, and they would actually end up going to prison for five years. By looking at the payoffs in this table, you can see that actually defecting strictly dominates cooperating, and then the the prisoners have individual incentives to accept the offer from the from the district attorney. However, if they both defect, they end up going to prison much longer than if both of them were to remain silent. In other words, corporate corporate Pareto dominates the effect effect. This is a situation where the behavior that is individually optimal leads to outcomes that are socially undesirable. And this, this is not just specific to the prisoner's dilemma. Actually, this is a game that it's used to model many different situations that you know maybe we'll talk about in, in the future. So game theory helps us to make predictions given a specific game. But as we learned when we were studying mono oligopolies, changing the rules of the game slightly can actually lead to many different, to very different outcomes. So for example, even fixing the demand and cost function of the firms, there can be some games that lead to the desired outcome A, while other games would lead firms to undesired outcomes B. So the problem of mechanism design would be the problem of identifying those games such that uh, actually are going to induce the behavior that, that we would like to achieve from a social perspective. And that is the task that we're going to try to do for the rest of the semester. Let us finish this video with one more example of effective versus ineffective mechanisms. In roads with schools, churches, or high pedestrian traffic, the Ontario government sometimes put signs with low speed limits for, people, for drivers to slow down. Of course, when you have a road that looks like a wide open highway, and you put a tiny side next to it and no enforcement, well, a lot of drivers will typically ignore the, the posted sign and uh, some of them will might not even notice it. For example, I don't know whether you yourself have noticed that Sarnia Road is a 50 km per hour road all the way from Wonderland. Oxford is also a 50 km per hour road all the way from um, Wonderland almost to downtown. Hyde Park has stretched at 50 km per hour and so on and so forth. In contrast, in other parts of the world, when the government wants drivers to slow down, they actually create roads that create the right incentives for drivers to want to do so. And the Netherlands in particular has been tremendously effective um, at, at doing that, and as a result, they, there has been a great divergence in, in, in fatal accidents on the roads between the Netherlands and other countries in the last 50 years. Now, in this class, we won't be talking so much about road design. We will focus on other problems of more, that have more of an economic nature, such as allocation problems or market design. And we will start next class as a motivating example, analyzing a, a well-known problem in, in, um, in the design of cities known as price paradox. So if you are curious about it, if you want to read ahead, I would encourage you to go to the Wikipedia page on price paradox, which is actually quite, quite good. And um, see you next time. If you have any questions, please go to the forums on OWL or send me an email. See you next time.